Good morning everyone, welcome to my channel. So today, once again, we're working on the project that I'm doing, following along with Susanna from Vintage Blend Studios. And the project is all about vintage sewing. So all sorts of things we've been exploring since the beginning of the year. Um, I've done my title page and I've done some English paper piecing. I've revisited cross stitch and we've been working on cut work which I have never done before. Susanna provided a uh, image and then it was a case of learning how to do cut work. And I must say, it is three days of my life I'll never get back. I did enjoy it in the end. It was um, really good. Made a few boo-boos in my piece and um, yeah, really happy with the result. Plus, when I turn the page, you'll see it. I had a piece that I inherited that I also have included on a second page in my journal. So here we go, the finished product. There we go. So the square or the rectangle in the center, that's Susanna's design. And then from there, from as you know, in the last video, I just started sketching out and building on the design. So it took me forever to do all of the little stitches. Luckily, I went on a road trip that was about three hours one way, three hours the next way. And um, it was highway driving, so I was able just to stitch. So it was really good. I got the boundary done, I got all of the little bridges done, and then it was just a case of doing the little stitches to finish off the piece. So that is it. It, um, yeah, really happy with it. And I think I'd honestly would do cut work again but probably maybe incorporated in some flowers that were like in a garden so I might go back to my um, Roxy creations um, down the garden path and see if I could work some cut work into those projects because I did really enjoy it I did get myself like let's let's be honest where are the boo-boos I got myself a bit muddy here I got myself a little bit lost. The plan was to do Susanna's section in the cream and then all of the little bridges on the outside would be in this chocolatey brown. But in here, those two little bridges I did in the cream by mistake. And to undo them, is it's a nightmare to undo this. You've sort of got to keep your wits about you. So once I'd committed to those there, I couldn't really do the rest in the cream. So I had um, the chocolate, so I had to stay with the cream for the rest of the grid. And I don't mind, like, unless I told you, you'd think it was part of my design. Um, that there, that one there, I probably should have brought it up to the tulip, joined it in, and it would have been a stem. So that's an error in the design, I believe. That would have looked a lot better. Then I would have had a stem here, stem here, and a stem here. I probably could still come back, connect one in and bring it through. I could save that with the stem, but I didn't. I was sort of over it. I figured that was enough. Let's pretend the stem's hiding behind that bar there. And like I said, this got a little bit muddy here. When I did it, I had a bit of the pink this side and a bit of the green this side when I realised that the cream should have come right through or one leaf comes over and then that sat behind. I sort of lost my way with the lines here because you got the tulip, the edge and the leaf. So I sort of had to, and because it's hard to unpick, there is green and there is pink in behind there. So I end up coming through with the cream again. It's not as neat as you would want it. You certainly wouldn't put this in the country show to be judged because you wouldn't, wouldn't win. That would win. And that was done by someone who's done a lot of cut work and it's beautiful. So I ended up using the blue again as my background, which ties it into this page. And I'm really, really pleased with it. So thank you. Thank you, Susanna, for pushing my boundaries and um, making me explore cut work. So we're up to the next pages. Now, what is our prompt? That's vintage sewing accessories. Okay, now I went hunting, first of all, for some vintage sewing accessories and I've got plenty of bits and pieces because I inherited 
my grandmother's sewing machine, the old Singer sewing machine. And in the drawers, well, hers has actually got three drawers. So this instruction booklet isn't quite her machine. She's got the three hanging underneath it, not two. Maybe she bought the deluxe, I don't know. So I've got the old instructions out of the drawer and in amongst it all were just bits and pieces left from the days when she was using the machine. There's little tins, her old scissors. Oh, there's all sorts of stuff. That's where I found my book all. Um, I've got it packed away at the moment. I use it for making um, journals. I'm going off on a tangent here. It was in that sewing machine when I got it back to Brisbane and I didn't know what it was. So then I discovered journal making and they were using, you know, a pokey tool and that I didn't put the paint on it either. That was in one of these little drawers. Now, according to my mum at the time, she thought it was used by granddad for leather making. But then my aunt, mum's sister, she seemed to think that it was um, my grandmother's aunt's. So we've guesstimated that this piece is 100 years old plus, but we're just, just not sure it was just sitting in one of those drawers. Along come 2020 when we all started to get very much locked down and I thought, well, I'm going to need something to do. So I discovered um, journal making YouTube and all of that and that's where this book all came into play and I was like, oh, I've got something sharp like that down in that little drawer. So I went down to the sewing machine, pulled it out. Jeez, I'm off on a tangent. So I thought, well, if I'm going to look for some vintage sewing accessories, one would go back to that sewing machine and I pulled this little guy out. So that little piece with those little snaps is going to be included. So that's the, that's where we're heading with that. Now, I'll just put it aside because that sort of then sent me down a rabbit hole of the sewing machine. So I then recalled, I'm going to put this book away, but I'm going to do a spread in the middle because there's just too much in this category for me. So I'm going to do both these pages here. So let's put the journal away for now. And I will show you a quilt that I purchased in 2020, a block of the month. Now I got it from the girls that own the store out at Toowoomba called, oh, I should have checked that. Um, I'll think of it by the end of this series. Oh gosh, I've ordered so many things from them over the last few years. But anyway, this so this block of the month is technically not available anymore because it was actually released back in 2020. All right, so that's the little packages and everything in it was supplied. So it was a case of make them up and it becomes quilt. Now I really don't need a quilt. So I, in the process of finding Rachel and the journal making, I started exploring um, Slow Stitch back in 2020. So I realized that these days for me, I did back in the 90s, and as much as it caught my eye, it was a lovely project and it had everything in it. And for lockdown times, this was perfect. I didn't have to go too far because you got everything and they sent you one a month. I started working on it. Now, I only completed two blocks because I turned them into slow stitch things because I'd had such a collection of doilies and you know what my world's like. So I used the basic um, block and then I embellished on top of it. Let me just come up a little bit. Jeez, I'm so off the track here, but you'll see where I'm heading with it. <clears throat> so this was the first one and I added fabric and I embroidered the flowers, which is just exactly what we're all doing now. But this was when I first started back in 2020. So it's taking a simple block of the month that caught my eye. So all the background was thought out and I just had to complete the background and then embellish. And this one's been cut to size, ready for the next block to make a quilt. In the process of doing it, I'm thinking this is really not a smart idea because then you've got a quilt with all this stuff hanging off of it. 
which is hard to launder and yeah, I was thinking, oh boy, so maybe I just frame it. What do I do now with the rest of the kits? So the whole project sort of got packed away. I did do a second one and that's probably about when my thought process was like, how am I ever going to launder this with all of these bits on it? So here comes the sewing machine and you know where I'm heading now. The, the whole concept of adding on to the quilt and I embroidered all of the fabrics on it. Like every, my rule is every panel got embroidered in some way, whether there was a flower on the design that I spotted and reworked it, but yeah. And they took, took ages and ages and ages. Like I embroidered that leaf and then I've added this doily. In the process, this doily would go down over the next block that would sit, you know, below. So that's the project. It then got packed up, put into its container, and I haven't pulled it out since. So what I'm going to do, and since doing this quilt, I've discovered the fact, thanks to Rachel, that we can make journals with these types of projects inside in a smaller scale. So the plan now is these two pieces I will um, frame and put them on my wall because they very much suit my sewing room. I love everything vintage and I love everything sewing. So they are going to be framed and I did a, uh, a shadow box. When my grandmother passed, there was so many little bits and pieces that came from her sewing room. I got a shadow box from Ikea. So it's a shadow box is where you get a frame and it's deep. So you can stand things in there. You can have quite chunky things like bottles of buttons and things like that and some photos and all sorts of things. I did a like in memory of her, this shadow box and that's already framed. So I'm thinking now, this has all happened in the last 10 minutes. I'm thinking I will frame these, put it with the shadow box on my wall in my craft room. So now I don't feel so bad that I've half, well, I'm not even halfway through this quilt. I am nowhere near halfway. So that's the plan for all of that. In amongst here are some fantastic designs that I do want to do. And I've got the fabric. So this in itself is a future journal. So that's the plan, a future journal. And I'm just putting it back in my box where it all came from. The other thing in amongst there are some images to do with the garden, which I'm going to bring into my um, uh, Down the Garden Path project. But I won't show you those today. That's another video, another day. Otherwise, we will never get started. Now, the one that I just showed you completed was this sewing machine kit. So, being that... We have a topic of vintage sewing accessories. I thought I would revisit these designs because I just love them. Love, love, love them. And to have them in the journal to do with this particular sewing project would be fantastic. That leftover um, packets with all the fabric in them, that's another journal another day. And it goes into fashion. It goes into perfumes, gardens, things like that. So what I'm thinking of doing with this whole block of the month is I will pick elements out of the whole kit that suit other projects I'm working on and the remaining ones that I never do will go into a journal on their own. So that whole block of the month will drift through the Down the Garden Path project. It will drift through this one and this, this particular block is going to appear in this project. And then if I want to do future pieces for walls or whatever, it doesn't matter. Maybe I do a fashion journal. One in there looks very French. So maybe I use that as part of a Paris type stitchery or I, I don't know. <clears throat> so I actually feel a lot better about having invested in a block of the month that I'd taken in a different direction and was very concerned about even using it. Um, in the future for a quilt because I was embellishing it so heavily. Anyway, that's the backstory of where I'm heading. My block of the month I purchased in 2020 is going to be 
split up into so many projects and used wherever and there's no pressure on myself anymore to complete a quilt that technically can't even be used as a quilt because I've gone off the garden path and started heavily embellishing. All right, enough yibby yabba. So the plan is <clears throat> using the little triangle of snaps, I'm going to create a two page spread. That's my little snaps. I'm going to create a two page spread in my Susanna project, revisiting the sewing machine that Libby Richardson created for this project, Vintage Treasures. Like how it's just synergy is unbelievable. I think it's because I, I'm attracted to those types of things. So that's why this all happened. So this is my inspiration. I've gone in and opened up the little kit that came with it. That's all of the elements. So, and I have now taken a photocopy of the patterns. So that can go away now because I have a photocopy of the pieces that I want to reproduce. So I'm definitely going to do the sewing machine, most likely do something with the, the reels of cotton. And I love this little piece. So that's the plan, two page spread. Now, background. This is where I think we might use, I'm just grabbing the container, sorry guys, leaning in. This is where we might use that camphor quilt. Because it's sort of neutral. I didn't end up putting that lace around the cutwork. I just didn't think it needed it. I think it had enough, enough going on. All right, so let's get the camphor quilt out. Let's get everything out of our way because we're about to get messy. I should open that up because there'll probably be fabrics in there. Now we need to find a fabric that complements. I oh, just love that. Do we use that or do we keep it neutral? And we'll make a decision in a minute. Now the other thing, in the box where all these pattern bits were, were all my pieces that I was using for embellishing. And on that panel that I did complete, I noticed that I had used one of these. And I thought, I would like to do that again in this journal. And it does suit my colour scheme beautifully. Where's my journal? See? It works. We've got the mustards, we've got the blues. It really, really works. And I thought, well, the quilt is no longer going in that direction. It's going to turn up wherever in whatever. So I thought I might as well grab these fabrics out because they do suit, except for that red. That red really needs to go with my red work box. So I might do that. I'm going to put that with my red work box. <clears throat> but all these pieces certainly work. What have we got here? A heart. Why have I got a heart? Oh, okay, so I mustn't have stitched that. Okay, well there's a heart. A cameo. Did I not do a cameo? I think that's the second one. We don't need a cameo. A little bit of fabric. From Rachel. Oh, hello. Buttons and threads. So that's. Oh, I remember now. Because this is a block a month, this element was actually going to be attached where the next block joined in. Let me grab this. Yeah, see it down here? So there would be another block coming through here, and this little piece, this buttons and threads this design was would sit over the two joining. So it was a case of it came in the pack, you traced it all out, but you didn't need it until you needed it. Well, that's a bonus. We're definitely gonna include that then. And the heart is here. We didn't use that, probably because I had so much um, bits joining it that the heart, yeah, that's what it would have been. 
Corinne went off on her tangent and down in that corner, I bet she put something that the heart was no longer needed. Let me have a little look. I bet you that's what she did. See, when I know I'm semi in trouble, I talk in the third person. Where is it? Oh, I did put the heart on, but I didn't write the word love. I used little hexagons instead and English paper pieced them together. So the word love would have appeared there. And I mustn't have liked the mustard fabric that they gave me. Where is it now? I mustn't have liked that mustard. So I did my own heart. That's what happened there. Well, we might use that heart because that works with my piece. Okay. That explains that mystery. How many of you have these unfinished blocks of the month in the cupboard? Get them out. Let's bring them into the slow stitch world. Let's turn them into journals because how many quilts do we actually need? Yes, I know you're all sitting there going, yep. Okay, so we can get rid of that. We've got our patterns. That's already taken care of. I've got a heart here happening. Well, let's trace that while we're speaking. Those fabrics will all work. They're scraps, so I don't have to go too far. And those scraps then can join this journal because they will work. Let's grab a pen. I can't even see. I can't even see underneath. That sort of looks like a fabric I would have owned, not one that was in the pack. Oh, can't see underneath, so we need to create some form of scrolly something because that scrolly something appears on the sewing machine. <clears throat> so let's try and do something a bit tricky here and then I'll just stitch it. I don't even know if I like it, but it's something. I think the heart needs to be a bit bigger and then I'd have more room. Doesn't matter too much. As we know, we're heading off <clears throat> on a tangent here. So I think this video will be about just getting all of our little elements together to build the story based around Susanna's prompt, which is vintage sewing accessories. So there's a few things we could probably, we should probably have a curl come in here to join it. Certainly not the right shapes, but doesn't matter. Gives us a fancy little heart. Do we want the word love in there? Do we want the word vintage? Do we want the word sewing? Do we want the word accessories? I'm thinking the word vintage, actually. So let's, let's revisit the word vintage and do something. fit at all. Good thing about these pens is we can just iron it out. I can't. It's very close but I think when I go to stitch it I might even make my heart a little bit broader through the bottom here to give us just that little bit extra wording space. And then I'll iron that word vintage out and I'll have now just that, probably don't need to iron it out. If I bring my V over a little bit to start with and then my I over a little bit, 
my N over a little bit as I go, my T, my A, then my G will have plenty of room and my E will have plenty of room. So that will work. Yeah. So we've got a bit of a plan anyway for this little guy. And being he's on such a small scrap of fabric, that's going to be a bit of a painful experience to stitch. So what we might do, and you think it's a little, little element, but once you start embroidering, it doesn't matter how big they are, even the little ones, they can just take forever. What I'm looking for is I've just jumped up to my Calico bucket and I'm looking for a piece of Calico to go behind that. So there's a bigger piece of, so that was my fabric. I must have had a plan. I thought it looked familiar. I had a plan for it, but it didn't, didn't quite happen. And for the life of me, I cannot see. Oh, there it is. I knew I had a piece. Here's a piece of calico. Or muslin, if you're in another country. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to use that as a bit of backing. It'll give my hands something to hold. I can always cut around the piece and um, have calico peeking out from behind the heart as a layered effect, It'll, but it will be something. Yeah, I'd say what I'll end up doing is I'll cut it a little bit further out again and then fray it all up so it becomes quite textured. Or I could put it in a frame, who knows. But the first job will be just to get it stitched in whatever colours we end up going with. So that piece is ready to go. Actually, let's, let's have a look at this piece. Same where we've got ourselves a decent piece of calico. I can see that quite well through there. So I'm going to zoom in so you two can see. And I'm going to trace that onto here and I will stitch it. Do I want layers? Meaning should I do something similar to that where I have a layer of fabric? Um, I think I will hold that thought. Will this piece of calico take the design? Yes, it will. Okay, so we'll pop that over there. And let's get these little fellows. Can I fit the semicircle? Yeah, I can. Okay, we're going to actually include the semicircle. Let's sketch both semicircles and then I can use the outer one to give me a piece of maybe blue fabric or something that will pop. So what I'm thinking is I will stitch the buttons or the, the cotton and the scissors. I will then cut it out on the outer ring. I will lay my piece down on say a contrasting fabric like a blue, cut it out. So now I have a blue ring sitting underneath it. Then I trim back again around this edge. So the blue is exposed. So then I have the calico with the embroidery, the blue fabric, and then it's ready to apply to the masterpiece. <laughs> that is our slow stitch. So this one's going to be all about getting lots of little elements made and then piecing it together in the final piece. This is going to be fun. I don't quite see the intricacy of this design, so I'm going to have to keep having a little peek to make sure I follow my stitch line. There's something tricky happening in there, which I can barely see. 
but we can maybe simplify that a bit like that. And then there's the scissors coming out there. Okay, so we've got a little scroll here. There's a, this little scroll appears through the project or the quilt all the time. So we've got the word cotton written here, C-O-T-T-O-N. It's so good to be able to use uh, patterns that you've maybe already used once. So you feel like you're getting a bit of value for your money if that pattern gives you another element in another project. I really like that. Because these, let's let's be honest, these blocks of the month, they get up there in price. So there's thread coming through here. Doing this project led me to find Jessie Chorley, actually. When I was on YouTube, I found Rachel, I found Gail. Then I found Jessie Chorley, and it's because Rachel was working on one of Jessie's pieces. And I'm like, well, who's this Jessie Chorley? And as soon as I found her, it was sort of like what I was doing with this block of the month myself. And then Rachel did the tags with Anne Brooks. And once I started looking at what Anne does, I was like, well, I'm doing that with my block of the month. And then I just knew I'd fallen into a world of, world that was my world too. So that's sort of how my world evolved back in 2020 because it turned out I was already doing a mix of Jessie and Anne Brooks and Rachel and Gail anyway and I think what happened because I was already quilting and sewing hand sewing and I published a book and I was already in that world but the slow stitch movement hadn't yet arrived back then and it was like liberating when I found it because it sort of allowed me to be very creative without being too conformed into a particular style of sewing. Okay, so there's the cottons. So I guess that's a bit of the history of how I came to where I am today. I was sort of on the outskirts of lots of techniques, but journal making and this slow stitch mushed it all together and away it's gone from there. It's like being quite inspiring. Now I am going to pin that on there just to use it as stability. I don't think it'll be a feature, the background, like it will for the heart because we're already starting with Calico. I have a feeling I will trim it away and um, then we'll get a blue fabric probably in under this little piece. So I'll trim, you know, everything back when we're ready. So that's ready to go. That's ready to go. Now let's have a look at this little piece. That's that guy. And I can sort of make it out. See, this pen wasn't even in my life back then. And I used a pencil. So I'm just going to go over it because let's just not make their eyes work harder than they need to. I'll just revisit the wording. What's that ear doing? That's just being a little tricky. How will I stitch these letters? Will I couch them with a thread? Will I satin stitch? I don't know. We'll see what takes my fancy when it comes time to take my fancy. I'm so pleased that I'm not having the pressure of that quilt hanging over me. I sort of, you know, when you buy a project and you have the best intentions and then you head off in a different direction for whatever reason, it might be the project you just lose interest in or you're thinking that it's not what you thought you were going to do, whatever the reason. And then you've got this guilt in the background of, 
I spent all that money. I should just commit to it and get it done. Well, that's sort of how I felt with this a little bit because I started embellishing everything. I was dreading the fact that one day I might have to launder it. And for, at the end of the day, I live in Queensland. Do we get cold that needs a quilt? Not really. So like my quilting days, I've got a cupboard of quilts in there that I've barely pulled out. And they're all embroidered. They're not as embellished as we are with the slow stitch world. They're just pieced together and then I've gone and just embroidered them. So they're not as full on as this one became with doilies and buttons and things like that. But they're still in the cupboard. They haven't come out. And I think that was sort of the realisation that, you know, I'm making another one. But if I can put it into a journal, a version of it, it obviously caught my eye. I obviously love the colours, the concept, the theme. So that there is buttons, technically. So I can get some buttons from somewhere and we'll do something there. And then there's a needle. So that'll bring a needle into our theme. And then we've got a thread that's whipping around and looks like it comes part of this stitching around that perimeter. So we'll just work that into there. Okay, that's great. Can we get that onto this fabric as well? So let's have a look at this. I wonder if I move this up and that up I'll just I'll take you back up oops so I'm going to try and get all of these pieces on this fabric yes beautiful so I will invisible stitch these all together so for those new to my channel and you're thinking what is she talking about that's just tacking it's just tiny little stitches to hold all of these bits and pieces together so that I can get rid of pins. We've all decided we don't like pins jabbing us. So invisible stitch has turned into a practice we do in the slow stitch world because there's usually so many elements that go to these pieces. So there's bits of this and bits of that. So we pin it all and then we're happy with our composition so then we're like, well, how do I handle this without drawing blood? So that's where this invisible, I might even turn that that way. That's where this invisible stitch came along because it allows us to do a tiny little stitch up here, but on the back, you can jump ahead to where, say, that pin is going back in. That's a good, you know, fingernail length. Then come back up to a tiny little stitch. So it's invisible this side. and um, holds everything down on something like that and then I can take all the pins out. Okay, so that's that sorted. I've recycled, that's great. So that little, I better hang on to it because I might need to refer to a design element if I get a bit muddled somewhere and I'm like, I can't read it properly. I go back to that. The sewing machine. What are we going to do with that? Let's have a look through these scraps and see if there's a fabric I could recycle out of this project. There's a yo-yo. We better, better use the yo-yo. There's only one. Oh, look. I have more yo-yos cut out. Awesome. Let's add them to our page, guys. Remember, we've got two pages to fill. That's gorgeous. I wonder if I could use that in some way for this. There's this piece of fabric that tacks in under the needle of the sewing machine on the bench so it looks like it's, yeah, that might be good for that. These are so good colours for this. Oh, I wonder about that. 
And I definitely know I want to incorporate, um, I wonder if I could use that for my sewing machine. I definitely want to incorporate some of this. So one of these will be cut out and somewhere on the page, I think. And then what we'll do is we'll go back through our pile of bits and bobs left from the first few pages, bring them out, and we might be able to incorporate some little pieces that tie it all together then. You know, some of these little bits we can bring in. So we've got plenty of fabric now to build on our book. It all matches. So all of that will stay together. And we've got some yo-yos. Love it. Okay. I'm going to use this for my sewing machine. Is it big enough? Yes, it is. Now, I want my sewing machine to have integrity on its edges, like the one I did on the quilt. So I need to use some iron-on visor fix or iron-on stabilizer to achieve that and I'm pretty sure yeah here's some so that shininess there see it's glistening that tells me there's a glue that's just interfacing it's not got no glue it's just to stabilize pieces but this is what we want so the plan is to trace trace that always cut the applique stitchery backwards and a little bit bigger does that apply to me probably not because I'm going to yes it will because I'm actually going to put the blue fabric here no, I'm not. Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm going to have my blue fabric here. Therefore, it's flipped. Okay. Oh, went blank there for a moment. So I'm going to now just trace around this. And then I'm going to cut it out. I haven't done this type of work for a few years, this applique. Then I'm going to iron this so that my sewing machine attaches to the blue fabric. That will stabilize all of the edges because I want my sewing machine to be quite defined like not frayed and because it's going to be the hero on the page it's part of your vintage accessories you would need to do all these projects is you would need a sewing machine and back in the day it would have been a sewing machine like my grandmother's so there's my little sewing machine so let's take that out This iron-on product you can get at all good quilt stores or sewing shops or Spotlight. It's everywhere. It's a very old piece, so I hope the glue works. So now the plan is to iron that onto there. All right, and then I've cut it out, and when I flip it over, I'll have myself a sewing machine. So I'm just going to stop the video for a moment. I'll go and do that. What have we got? 15 minutes left then. Then we'll come back and have a look at our background, make a decision, and see, you know, sort of where we head from there. All right, guys, I will see you in a moment. Hi, guys, I'm back. 
you won't believe what happened. And I bet you guys were all watching it going, she's going to realise in about 10 seconds what she has done wrong there. I sketched the sewing machine out with the heat pen, right? So I whizzed around a few seconds ago, went to the iron, ironed the fabric, popped my machine on, and as soon as I touched it, I'm like, I wonder if that glue still works. Lifted it up and my sewing machine had disappeared. Good one. So I quickly pulled it apart. It hadn't adhered at that stage. It has now. I quickly pulled it apart and um, had to retrace my sewing machine with pencil because the heat friction pen disappeared. So I bet there was someone out there, if not all of you going, Corinne, when you go to iron that together, you are gonna lose your sketch. It goes to show how long it's been since I've done this style of, um, you know, applique where you bond onto the back of it, a piece of this, to sort of stabilize all your edges. Now, technically, I didn't need to do this. I could have just cut it out and stitched it down because that's slow stitch. Frayed edges, I do this all the time. But I just want the sewing machine to be sharp on my page. I want it to, I want to pay it the respect that it needs by having the defined shape that is this beautiful sewing machine. So I'm thinking I will use this heat and bond. It will stop it from fraying. And it's reinforced. Now there is other products out there where um, you get a second lot of glue and you can then glue it down to your piece. But I'm not too worried about that because I know my stitching my overcast stitch or blanket stitch, whatever I choose to use, will hold it down. But if you were doing something where you wanted it all to be layers of these elements, let's say you were doing, I don't know, a bird, and the bird's feathers were full of different types of um, fabrics to create layers, well, then you use a product that would have the second layer of glue, which is usually hidden by paper and you would then peel the paper off and then heat again up the iron and glue with the iron down all of the little elements to create your feathers on your bird. But I don't need that in this scenario. So I'm just using an interfacing that has glue on one side. It at least will stabilize my edges and uh, allow me then to just stitch it straight on without having the need for it to be glued into position. I could have used just some art glitter glue, and I've done that before, where I just drizzle a little bit around my fabric so that those frayed edges don't happen. But at least this will be very defined. So there's my sewing machine. Actually, I might hang on to those little bits because maybe we'll need a pop of blue when we start piecing it all together. So we've got a sewing machine and we've got all of these little elements. Now, I'll keep that handy in case I want to refer. Well, I need to work out how I'm going to do all this, but not today. We've just got our little piece ready. So let's have a look at our background and we need to decide what are we going to use? I sort of feel like it's this one and I think it's because I feel like I'm looking at wallpaper in my grandmother's sewing room I'm not she didn't have wallpaper in her sewing room but I sort of feel like this soft element of floral in behind is like the wallpaper in grandma's sewing room for example vintage this 
feels very country. So I don't think it's going to be the stripes. What's on the other side? See, it's a different blue again. I think it's going to be this one, guys. So let's have a look at our journal and see what sort of size we need to do our spread. And I guess the question is, do we cut it in the middle or do we stitch it through? And it just becomes one spread. I think I'm going to cut it in the middle and because I don't want to add bulk here. And I really need to use one of these as a template. And I've run out of fabric for future pieces. So what I'm going to do is before I cut into that beautiful piece of camp, I'm going to get my calico and we're going to prep some more pieces for my book <clears throat> and then I can use that as my template so that I cut exactly what I need out of the out of the camphor quilt without wasting so that's the size there that I've used And then this salvage can come off. Yes. So that salvage can go. There's one for a future piece. So we're prepping a few more pages for coming prompts from Susanna and in the process creating a template I can use so that I get the right amount of camphor quilt out without wasting a morsel of it. Such a warped piece of calico. There's a slight bend in it. And you know the rule, always use your original piece, never use the piece you've just torn because each time it'll just get that little bit bigger and you'll end up getting to the end and your final piece will be completely different size to the original you started with. So either go back to where you took your measurements from, like the book, and just use that as your guide that's a bit of a, a hot tip there I'm going to keep going back to the book because then I know that it's spot on oh, this is good we've prepped a few pages We've worked out what pieces are going to go into the project. So some key pieces, so to speak. We won't work on composition yet. We'll, we'll do that in the next video once I've had time to stitch them all. It'll give me some homework for a few, few weeks. Well, a week. So we've got one, two, three, and four ready to go. So let's put the spare three for a moment in that back pocket because that's where I'm keeping all of the bases. And then this little piece of seam binding is getting mushed around as I drag this book around. So I'm just tucking that in there as well so it's nice and safe. So let's go to the centre of that signature where this spread's going to be. Well, I presume we're going to do two. I'd say we'll need to. 
and that's the big piece and of course it's bigger than my signature because I made the the base of the signature a little bit smaller but I've got the whole of that as my size which is perfect and then if I want bits hanging out I can I know that I just cannot go any bigger than this it's so wonky let's just get a bit of a warmth and a width that's better okay so it'll sit slightly inside my cover and it does hang slightly out so if I put lace or something that peeks out of the the book but the pages that I'm attaching to they are smaller that just helps with a little less bulk you could even make this even that big as long as you've got something to attach to so that um, your journal pages are stitched in okay so we can pop our book away all right we have our template all being very wonky so let's just pull that back into position. Let's grab our piece of quilt. And we've decided we're going to use this because it just feels like it's more of a grandma's sewing room look. I'm going to use that as my template. And I'm going to cut myself a beautiful piece of camp. Got enough flowers, yep. Do I want to catch them? I think I do. Am I overthinking it? Probably. I'm going to move it along a bit. Or do I catch them in the next one? See, they're sort of going to get chopped through there and be lost. I'm going to catch them in the next one. I'm going to move my pick cutting over a little bit. Yeah, that'll be a morsel we can use on another page and that'll sort of help tie the project together anyway. So I'm not too worried. So let's pick a line of stitching that the person used to make this quilt. I'm going to go right there and cut through. So I'm technically trying to stay within the boro stitch that was used To join all of these fabrics together like there's heaps in there look layers and layers of fabric stitched together gosh there'd be probably about eight pieces of fabric I can see in there to make this little piece okay now I'm pretty sure I got this from Lisa Mattock. Her website's um, Forage. So if you are looking to invest in some camphor quilt, head over to Lisa's page. Pretty happy with that as my guide. Found a stitch line I can follow. Little morsel. And another little morsel. Lovely. Now being that this fabric is quite sturdy, this quilt, I'm not going to need this. That is purely just to give me my sizing. So there's another one on my desk. I'll just give that a stretch to try and square this up a little bit. It's so warped out of shape. So that can go away now into the back pocket ready for another day okay guys we've made a decision we've got some elements to stitch we're having a sewing machine we've prepped some future pages for the next projects and we have a beautiful piece of camphor quilt 
to work on. Now I'm not going to cut my second one yet until we get to the next stage where I have completed all my homework and I've stitched, I've embroidered all these and they're ready to go. At least now I know the project colors. I can keep those little bits in here. I know the project colors. So that'll make it easy when I start selecting my cottons. I can have a think about these coppers. I can have a think about that plummy purple there and um, sort of help tie it all together. So maybe my sewing machine goes down the bottom here so that I've got room for something else. Okay. Once I sort of get a feel for all the space and elements, I'll be able to work out a composition and it'll be the second page. So we'll get to that. In the meantime, I've got plenty to do and I will see you all in the next video as we um, start building the layout. Okay, everyone, have a great week and I will see you all next time. Bye for now.